Well, thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, and nice to see you here. Unfortunately, there's two speeches going at the same time, but I'm glad you chose us. I only needed to pay about half of you, so it's fine. Anyways, welcome. Let's see. This 45 minutes should be inspiring and interesting, at least what we hope that that will be. Uh, as I said, my name is Petri. And I'm Matti. And we are the comedy duo of the day. All right, Nurka, a couple of slides. I'm not going to go too deeply into what we do, and you know, this is not a company's presentation, but basically what happens is that Nurka is a company that does high-end design on the cusp or the verge of technologies, new technologies, new cultures, and lots of digital stuff as well. But we are not purely digital. We do a lot of stuff as well, which you will see later on in the presentation. We have won all sorts of awards. We also won the Red Dot this year. I was quite proud of it. There's going to be a gala in Berlin next month, and I don't know what to wear, which is probably the biggest issue that we have. All right, Amsterdam and Helsinki are st stationed in Amsterdam and Helsinki, and we're probably going to open up a new office in Palo Alto in Silicon Valley this fall. We have a new client there. It's a pretty big project. A uh, couple of words about the project. Actually, it illustrates quite well on what NordCap actually does. A uh, client is like this data analytics tool, and they are able to produce huge amounts of real-time data and analytics and you know, thinking to their customers, but we are making an avatar out of it. The presentation started, you all probably have seen Lord of the Rings. Uh, you know, the Eye of Sauron, this big, big flaming thing, basically. So we're creating basically an avatar of the data, something which is actionable, usable for everyone, not just for data scientists. And I think that's one of the key issues about our approach to things. Uh, we try to see beyond the first reason. We talk a lot about the second reason. All design work from us comes, and it's actually based on this second reason idea. I might be an e-shop, but my second reason is to do something else. And to find this something else is super interesting and super useful for the customers. Matti, this is the Perit. Now it works. Yeah, Perit, one of my favorite projects recently. Uh, Sleep Tracker, we have been working with them uh, maybe one and a half year. Uh, ultimate goal happened a few months ago. It was acquired by Apple. Uh, and uh, we are very proud of working with them. And we are also quite proud of the design, because the design was the reason that Apple bought the Bedit. We did everything from the applications, from all the iterations of the application, from Apple Watch to blah, 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 the app itself, and then the product design and the industrial design on it. And um, well. As Matti said, about three months ago, I was asked for a meeting with the guys from Berit, and they fired us. And I was like, okay, why did you fire us? We were bought by Apple. I was sad and happy at the same time. And I had a really uh, expensive bottle of champagne as a gift. But it was. Uh, solving sleep. Uh, Berit, we don't just do like, you know, traditional design. Uh, we do philosophies and strategies as well. Uh, we did a lot of research work on actually sleep and, you know, this like sleep, you know, uh, meters and all sorts of applications. Uh, it's not about being more efficient. It's not about having more, more performance. But its mission, which can last for 6,000 years, is to solve sleep. And now, you know, this might sound like super cliched, but solving sleep is a promise. It's a guiding light, a north star for the whole company, the way they develop their stuff forward. And this is one of our key points we're going to go back to in the presentation today is that, I mean, as designers, we need to go into the abstract. It's not just about the craft. I mean, solving sleep is not a, sleep, it's a sentence, it's two words, but it has nothing to do with visual design. My background is in visual design, but I mean, nothing to do with visual design. It has nothing to do with UX design or anything like the traditional design competencies, which means we are living in a post-craft world. All right, Umbra is this um, 3D uh, stuff. Basically, what we're doing now, when you look at virtual reality, reality or mixed reality or uh, uh, these kind of things, we are creating a design language for it, like Google's material design, basically, but for the VR or mixed reality environments. This kind of cool. We're quite proud of this work as well. Yeah, uh, this is like a really interesting stuff. Like I mentioned earlier, I, I've been working with the AI stuff, and uh, when you sort of like take an AI approach uh, to take it to a virtual reality or augmented reality world, then things get really interesting and exciting. And we also have handsome people working with us. 
Okay, Telia is the biggest teleoperator in the Nordics. Uh, we've done, in the past year and a half, we've done a major transformation of the company, and we're going to go once again come back to this later on as well. Uh, when you look at the traditional teleoperator market, it's basically all about, you know, competing with price, which means that the business itself is broken. And we discovered covered the second reason for Telia. We're creating, like, there's about 15 innovation projects now in the pipeline, uh, from assistance to new kind of payments and these kind of things. And we have co-created all this stuff together with the customer. And stuff is coming out in probably next year and these kind of things. And one more indication that as designers, we need to be able to solve like bigger issues, the next problems, the next perhaps conundrums that there could be. And it's a good example on that. And one important part is to transform the organization. Uh, that's the one key point in actually most of the projects that we do. All right, we work at ING in Amsterdam. Uh, we've done a lot of like, you know, these future interfaces. This is for Nissan, was in Genova Motor Show, like these car interfaces for right where and now we're doing uh, similar, you know, hypothesis on actually like, you know, could the car be an experience at your home away and these kind of things. Anyways, all sorts of interesting stuff. Pivo, another bank, uh, this one, everything again. Uh, one of the first like, you know, uh, goal-oriented like banking apps with it and strategies. And now they actually have 500 people working in their innovation unit. And lastly, Santander, um, this is to actually like show a little bit glimpse into velocity. A couple of words about velocity. Um, let's say today is the starting day. In five months, we designed the concept of a social banking app. We designed the ID for a fingerprint sensor. We built it in China. And in five months, we launched the product or the prototype. Imagine, in five months, everything from visual design, brand design, concept design, uh, user experience design, uh, internal sales, and then the physical product itself in five months. And this is one of the cool things that, I mean, one of the th reasons why design agencies are booming at the moment is because we can work faster, smarter, uh, with more like, you know, <coughs> end, end user validation than traditional consultancies do. So anyways, we can work hard as well. Enough about us. What is it to be like to be a designer? And let's play a little game now, guys. You are all working at NordCup now. So what is really important, although we do everything with customer validation, co-creation, such issues, uh, the future isn't invented by designers, but it's basically facilitated by designers. But that said, you need to be the one with the best idea in the room. You don't need to be right. You don't need to have the correct path. But you need to have the best idea in the room. We are in the business of trust. If your customers, if your like, you know, friends or your peers trust you that, okay, you can show, be the North Star, show the direction, then we are pretty much winning. And although it's all about frameworks, it's still about the individual as well. It's not about having an ego, though, because although you have a best time in the room, don't be a jerk about it. I can be a jerk. We all can. <coughs> but it's not about ego. It's not about you. It's about the thing, right? But did you want to say something because you're not a jerk? I'm a jerk and I don't say anything. Uh, I have to say at this point, uh, I am working as a Petris bot, uh, artificial intelligent bot in this presentation. He is the keynote master of our company. I have a very limited capabilities uh, on this presentation, so I just try to help Petri. And one thing I am taking care of is the watch, so now we have to go forward. Be quiet and look handsome. <laughs> All right, I will say future is present tense. I'm going to go fast. Blah, blah, blah. We are ready to do some stuff. All right, actionable futures. This is a survey designed by Mark Stickton. Who has read this book? The AKQI, the previous presentation, actually showed a couple of tools which are related into this stuff. But we see this as a problem. I mean, the book was written in 2011, and now we are doing stuff and designing things which didn't exist then, which means that we need, need new frameworks, we need new tools. We need new ways of actually making things happen. Still, Have you guys uh, been ever thinking about this? Someone says something? Who has been using a design thinking methodology recently? Do you think that it has solved all the problems that you are facing in the project? Why is that?
Yeah, well, another challenge is that, I mean, if everyone is using the same method, then everything becomes similar. Because, I mean, there's no, like, you know, one set, you know, solution to problems. Problems are unique, companies are unique, situations are unique, ecosystems are unique, which means that, I mean, sometimes customization is really, like, needed. And also, there's a lot of, like, new stuff that didn't exist before. I mean, design thinking and, you know, let's say the double diamonds of the world are designed for efficiency. But efficiency is not anymore the only sole factor of doing great design or the only quality of great design. Um, design maturity is interesting. Uh, as an agency, we are mostly now, unfortunately, working with stage two companies, where, you know, a lot of companies like banks, uh, all sorts of companies are hiring designers. This is probably the best time to be a designer uh, in the world. You get paid well, and there's so many jobs around. You don't need to just work in an agency anymore. In the future, we are more moving into this thing that <coughs> design competence owned by every end-to-end -end product team. So in a way, design becomes invisible. Design is like this virus that infects companies. And when it infects the companies, it kills them. And then, you know, it's all about the virus. And I think, you know, we see like, you know, this transformation usually takes about three years. And uh, a lot of companies are even in stage three now, and a few companies are in stage four. Uh, people use Apple as an example of stage four company, but I'm not so sure about it anymore, to be honest. I mean, startups, growth companies, these guys are actually like leading the charge at the moment. Whenever I start working with the new client, I sort of like think that in which stage the client is when I start the project or whatever. And uh, my ultimate goal is to push the client to that last one and make my, me uh, unneeded anymore. I want that my client can be a designer by themselves. So my mission is to help them to be a designer. So I'm basically eating my own leg, which is not necessarily a clever, but I sort of like, like it anyway. That would look really good on stage, though, if you would eat your own leg. Yes, I can try that later today. Another thing which is quite interesting is that, I mean, the big consultancy companies like McKinsey's and Accenture's and these kind of guys are actually buying up, like, you know, design shops. And, you know, there's two ways that they can... It, all right, cool. It wasn't me. They didn't yeah. tell me to shut the hell hell up and go off the stage. Petri, right. your mother is waiting at the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> now I feel really safe. As I was saying, a lot of the big consultancies have been the buying design agencies, and there's two ways that this can work. One, uh, there's this big, huge, like you know, process consultancy, and they buy a really cool design agency with people that dress funny and speak funny, and this is the fashionable, you know, path. You know, we can tell our customers that we got the latest thing. You know, it's kind of like in this fashion statement stuff. Sometimes it, you know, works like this. The other way is that actually the consultancies themselves are adopting design thinking and these kind of new agile frameworks because they see that the basic consultancy business is broken as well. Vendor lock-ins, huge projects, you know, no measurable results and all such things that, you know, come from the old world of consulting. So anyways, these guys are hiring as well. Also, our designer is the new business consultants. I went to the art school. I've been a designer all my career. I've basically done nothing else in my career, which is a good thing and a bad thing, right? But now I'm in the boardroom, let's say, a big teleoperator, and telling their C-level people how they should change their, like, let's say, offering. Either these guys are fucking crazy that they listen to someone like me, or then there's something in the air, <laughs> seriously, or there's something in the air that, I mean, companies have like this intrinsic need to change. They understand that the markets and the world around them is breaking up, and they don't have the answers. And then they seek, you know, companies or methods which have, for instance, empathy. Understanding the external world, understanding the motivation of the customer, for instance, in a way that hasn't been done before. So it could be that we are the new business consultants as well. The market is booming. Uh, we are independent, fiercely independent, unless someone with a really big checkbook comes up. But anyways, design agencies have been bought, both by you know, private companies and consultancies and this kind of stuff. A lot of like assimilation has happened. Right. So we want to talk about uh, a couple of words about what is it to be a good designer in our viewpoint. I have to explain the title because this guy is actually called Plattu. So that's why they are platitudes. That joke didn't go too well. <laughs> Continue eating your leg, man. <laughs> Gary Hamill is one of my, uh, well, idols when it comes to the like, traditional like, you know, business strategy stuff. A noble purpose inspires, sacrifice, stimulates innovation and encourages perseverance. 
I get paid, I have a salary. I come to work every morning because I'm really inspired by my colleagues. I mean, really smart people working at Nurkup. And sometimes they're nice, they're nice as well. There's really good coffee, nice office. I get to do this kind of stuff, speak about stupid things to smarter people than I am. But that's not the point. The point is that seriously, in my heart, I have a deep belief that what I do can have an effect for the better. It's a really naive way, naive way to put it, but I can make the world more beautiful. I can make the world better for some people. So I think that one of the key you know, facets or characteristics of a good designer is to have a noble cause. And we are too cynical nowadays. We don't talk about this stuff at all. Be braver. Say that, okay, I have a noble, higher calling. That's really, really important. Infrastructure is much more important than architecture. You know Rem Kulhas, of course, <coughs> because you come from here, and he's a really cool guy as well. Uh, I might have a challenge of solving uh, a small feature, let's say, on a website. Let's go into the really basics, like some you know, purchase flow on an eShop, for instance. But what I actually should understand is that I'm solving the next thing, something which is connected to it, which could not be on the website as well. So understanding you know, frameworks, understanding ecosystems, and understanding how things link, link to each other is super important. Always be prepared to actually solve two things at one time. The second reason, as we talked in before. Uh, I am definitely experimenting in public at the moment. But I mean, this means that I mean, we need to also have bravery. I mean, when you look at the trends and all these kind of like, you know, fluctuations of styles and you know, disciplines that come to design, we are fashion conscious. That's what we are. And we follow trends and we create trends. But it's really brave to actually step out of these norms. One interesting like, aesthetic style recently has been this new ugly. How many of you guys know new ugly or brutalism, this digital brutalism? Oh, check it out, yeah. Anyways, so making things like ugly, not beautiful, could have a really big effect, for instance. I'm not saying that the direction you should take, but you should be brave enough to not you know, duplicate what you are good at, but do something else. The presentation this morning about the gastrophysics was actually a great example of that kind of things. Uh, the biggest thing is not about, you know, we are all, all ambitious, we know our shit, you know, we can do all kinds of cool things, and the customer is ambitious, wants to solve wicked problems. But my hypothesis is that, I mean, the biggest reason that we don't get shit done is because we don't have a common language. So actually, you know, not being able to draw or use design tools, being able to speak and communicate is super important. It's more important than your craft. The sad thing about artificial intelligence is it lacks artifice and <laughs> therefore intelligence. Uh, let's go back to the previous example of the eShop user flow. I would be the best UX designer in the world. It would be the most efficient UX flow in the world. And then my com competitor does the same thing, which means that things are clones of each other. This is the coolest thing about like, this advanced design stuff that we preach about. We actually can design machines or services which are subjective. Let's say the eShop is super efficient, but what if the eShop is super efficient and shy? Does it have quirks? Does it have personality? Does it have empathic qualities? Can it communicate with gestures or some micro interaction and these kind of things? So in a way, making things, uh, before we used to make things super smart, super efficient, machine-like, and now the machines are becoming subjective. And this is super cool stuff. And think about your competitor, it would be quite lame if they would copy your personality and, and, and make the same stuff that your, your eShop is actually doing. Exactly. I had a presentation this summer in Germany with this huge like, you know, industrial corporation. And we were talking about robot factories and this Industry 4.0 stuff. I was super into it. God damn it, you know, I always dreamed about having this big industrial client. And, you know, I was so geeking out on all blockchain enabled, you know, whatever, real time data, blah, 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 blah. Then I went to the hotel and next morning I took a shower and then I, something hit me. What I was presenting to the customer would make thousands of people unemployed. So as designers, we need to understand that what we're doing is not a bubble. I mean, it will affect people. Some things will be negative, some things will be positive, but what we do really has an impact on people's lives. So uh, this is about being answerable about what you do. Ethics are super important. Having an ethos is super important. And understanding the consequences of your work is super important as well. 
Uh, our creative director likes to use this quote about Nordkap, is that we are not a fucking family, we are a tribe with a common cause. Friction is super good with designers. With this. Uh, seriously, friction is really good. But, um, well, when I started my career, I wanted to be a really good, like, you know, technical visual designer. Then I wanted to win, win awards because, you know, my colleagues would then have some esteem on me, uh, well, value me more. And now I'm older, I sort of, like, you know, understood that uh, empathy is probably the best quality of a designer. Uh, going beyond your own ego or your ambition and be able to sort of, like, you know, be almost like, you know, monastic in your purpose of killing the ego. We have uh, 30 senior designers, no project managers, nothing. We employ only designers who have really, you know, good track records. And you would actually guess that, I mean, this sort of tribe would be like full of fights and, you know, egos and da 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 da. But actually, it doesn't work like that at all. We can have friction, but we don't have ego driven battles. And that's super important. Friction pushes things further, further all the time, and that actually makes the results more better and, and, and faster all the time. Some bold dude, I don't know who he is, says this. Uh, if I would present a company a really good transformation plan or some really super sweet solution, then it would be external. We work in a way that we go to the customer and we work together with the customer to make this happen. So in a way, we infect, we don't inject. We don't see that change can happen if it's like uh, presented. <laughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a cold. Uh, change can happen only if you are there with your hands on the dirt and you're not making it happen. Working together is super powerful. Once again, it's an old cliche, but it's super powerful. And that comes back to the uh, processes, for example, design thinking process. It is a nice framework. You can try it out, but quite often somebody says that, hey, actually, it didn't solve all the problems. And actually, all the organizations, they are different. The problems are different. The organization culture is different. And in order to succeed, you need to find out perfect method how that organization can change and can make the better things. And, and, and if you just give them design thinking book, do this, it probably don't work. How many of you guys have followed the Agile, let's say, development frameworks? How many of you guys have been doing millions of post-its, uh, making design visible, having stand-up meetings? You know, you know all this stuff, right? Uh, this is a quote by Noam Chomsky. I mean, the sentence is perfect in syntax, but it doesn't mean anything. One of the biggest, like, you know, problems or, you know, challenges that I think designers face is that we become slaves to the ritual. Are you really solving problems? Are you just putting post-its on the wall? Are you really thinking about, you know, making stuff happen? Or are you just, you know, participating in stand-up meetings? Some of these rituals or, you know, these new ways of working are so strict that actually we perhaps focus and use more energy on that than on the actual work. They are very useful and can be used in a good place, but the problem is that I mean, we need to be able to ditch them as well. So these were our nine platitudes about being a good designer. Anything resonate? Are you mad at us? All right, let's continue the last part of How much time do we have left? About 15 minutes. 15 minutes, all right. So. I posed a problem in the beginning that, I mean, we are living in a world that, you know, we design, let's say, uh, assistants, uh, virtual, like, personas. There's no design vocabulary or framework to do that yet. So we need to create it our own. We need, uh, as a company, we need to, we like to work with cu customers who are really, like, you know, trying to do something new, uh, actionable futures, which means that we need to design our own, uh, create our own frameworks and actually help make change happen. Here's a couple of examples. Uh, we're going to show three things. Optimal futures, backcasting, and binaries. You know, I might know backcasting. It's actually like my, one of my mentors is this professor called Lisa Valikangas from Helsinki. And with Gary Hamill, he wrote a book about this in the late 80s, I think. Customer centricity, empathy, measuring, and desiling are hygienics. I know that a lot of companies are still not at this level, but we feel that, you know, if this is like, you know, the current, let's say, I would get a brief to create or design a new, like, video service. And the client would say, okay, make it as good as, good as Netflix. That's not a brief. That means that we are doing something which is currently working, but it's not the next phase. And uh, a lot of companies are still struggling with these things, but we feel that these are already hygienics. We need a new paradigm. We need to go beyond this stuff. You need to know these things, but we need to go beyond this stuff. 
And once again, if we all use the same method, the dance is standardized, then the results are too. In the 1980s, I mean, the waterfall model was the thing that was used, and now we're using the double or triple diamond. We use triple diamond because, I mean, in the center, there's also like always validation, like, you know, co-creation with the customers and stuff like that. But that works. But now we are moving more and more towards like this circular or responsive organizations, which means that design teams, they might be from an agency or internal design team teams, business people, tech people are all working together. So in a way, the design is being like, you know, um, assimilated into all processes. Agile micro-goal-oriented micro development works, but as a downside, you focus on the micro, on the increment. What's the difference between incremental and innovational design? We fix some things, piece by piece, which makes a good product, but we don't then reach it or approach it from the goal forwards. So always, like, you know, try to still think about the big picture and the innovation stuff. And the problem with the current model is that we lose sight of what's possible. We know what's possible to do, but we don't know what's possible, what it can do. I know it's an abstraction, but I mean, that's one of the key big questions that we have. So, if you design for the future, you're constrained by the things that you actually understand today. And at NURCA, we are trying to erase the world f word future in lots of ways. You're optimizing if you talk about future. So instead, we design utopias. Imagine, such a small world, word, looks really like, you know, naive, but very powerful, because utopia is not future. Utopia is the best possible version of the future. And suddenly, your brain clicks, and you can do amazing shit. Not the future, not the tomorrow, but utopia. Plus, this also includes the, like, you know, the motivation or the value things in it as well. I mean, if you're gonna design for something positive, a better future, then it's utopia. And then we are you know, guided by all these tenets. So, replace your future with utopia, and you're doing way, way, way better. All right, backcasting. Uh, right now what we're doing, we create roadmaps, we optimize, align, pre-plan, scenario, audit, prepare. Basically we go from this moment to the next moment, and we might have a big audacious goal, you know, waiting behind the whole timeline, but what we're doing is we're going from today for tomorrow, which is this, from A to B. But this is actually really eye-opening. We're using this a lot in some cases. How about you do it another way? You design or decide on what the utopia is, and then you reverse roadmap it. And suddenly, all these issues about what's possible become less. People become much more motivated, and then you can reach the goal probably faster. This is a simple trick, but works, works really well, and you should probably apply it. And this can be applied to, for the micro project to the larger projects. This can be applied to designing the e-shop, or really different, like transforming your whole company and this kind of thing. So we, that's backcasting. And uh, that method, it's very, very nice to do in the big uh, business-oriented organizations because that way you actually sort of like can forget those constraints for a while. And, and, and there is a place where you actually can involve them to the process, but, but you start from the, that, that big, big thing on, on, at the end of the line. And uh, it actually quite often opens up the business guy's mind quite a lot because they are stick with the Excel and they, they always try to measure the business impact. But if they can forget it, it makes Yes, and also it means that we can compromise. As designers, we tend to compromise. We are not the you know, most alpha type personalities, seriously. Okay. We know we have this dream about this lofty goal and this like huge, and you know we have a vision of something, but then we start optimizing, and that's one of our like biggest faults. And with backcasting, you don't fall into that trap. All right, next one. Binaries. Human-centered design is the correct norm, right? Everyone knows this, right? You validate human-centered design, right? But emotive design, or you know, em emotive machines, beats currently beat efficient machines. If the things are clones of each other, then it doesn't matter which, what, which service would you use, what company you would choose, what sort of like, you know, things you would prefer. But if the things are emotive, then it's in, it gets really interesting. We use this thing called binaries. Uh, this was designed actually to, uh, this was uh, done to design uh, basically this uh, chatbot. And imagine, 15 people of the company made like these binaries, and then we put it all together, and now we actually have a really good, clear, and concise understanding on what the personality of the company is, what the personality of the chatbot is. And if it's, let's say, it's like, you know, focuses on task at hand, it means that 
needs to be designed from this viewpoint. This gives you the best design brief ever. I have never seen anything like this. So binaries are really good. But now comes the mind-bending stuff. What if we do it the other way around? We take the same tool and we actually like mine the tool's motivations towards the users. And then we put these two things together. So now we have the same sort of, you know, paradigm from the machine's viewpoint and then the human's viewpoint. And if we put this stuff together and some magical things happen. Then we can actually find the seams. Then we can find the things that actually make things innovative. I know it sounds really trippy, but we are actually thinking and designing currently from the machine's perspective. Machines and algorithms are becoming more and more capable all the time, right? We can be able to do stuff that we haven't done before. So imagine, no more human-centered design, but to use both viewpoints. And if you think about a system that doesn't have an interface anymore, quite often the design work is about the wireframes and visual design and, and how things look and feel. What if you have a, some kind of ghost living in this room who could talk to us and, and, and there is no interface? It can play music, on, it can do different things. Invisible machines. Yeah. And in that case, that kind of binaries, actually, they are the only way to actually describe the, what kind of system and what system it is, how it behaves and how I feel it. And it can also be so that Petri's machine or Petri's ghost is a little bit different than mine. My experience is a little bit different. So those binaries can be also personalized for each user and, and that kind of stuff. And it actually takes the thinking quite for quite a long jump from the traditional design thinking method where you actually start interviewing customers and, and approaching from that perspective. Because but you come from space. Okay, this is an end result. I mean, all this thinking, all this, like, you know, these experimental tools we have been using or telling you about, is actually distilled to this one little box. This is the work we've done, we're doing currently with our client, and you probably, how many of you guys can guess what it is? No, it's not a vaporizer. Yeah, it's basically like, you know, Alexa or Google Home, Google Echo and these kind of things. You know, Alexa, right? But it's not just about the box and the capabilities of the box. It's about the whole process. We'll be using all these tools, Optima Futures, backcasting, and then the binaries to create an assistant, which is actually a marketplace. And the marketplace will change the current company into a totally new business model. And this will, like, you know, bring out whole new technological and, you know, user interface opportunities to everyone in Finland. This is the real design project, not the box itself. Although it's quite beautiful, I think, and it's well made and looks smooth. But the thing is that, I mean, everything about the project is about out, what's outside of the box if you're going to use that term. And this is where we are as designers at the moment. We are dealing with problems or issues or opportunities which are this big. And I would hope that everyone, if you get one thing from this presentation, is that you understand how fucking cool it is. So, in closing, our mission is to remake the world. Believe in this stuff. Have a noble cause. Have a higher calling. Don't be shy about it. The world needs to be more equal. One of the biggest issues that we will face in the next like, few years, for instance, let's say that I, mean, we could, I could augment, in the next 15 years, I could augment my children to be 10% more intelligent, right? Uh, this technology will not be accessible by, let's say, hundreds of millions or even billions of people. Uh, disparity is one of the biggest like, threats that we are facing at the moment. So I think this is a good like, you know, lifeline. Uh, the world should be more equal. Uh, the shiny new things we design and invent should be accessible for everyone. I mean, we are creating amazing stuff, which means that, you know, everyone should benefit. I believe that the world should be more fair and balanced. It's not about the color of your skin, the way, how much money you have, where you're from, and these kind of things. I think it's a really cool thing. Technology can be a great equalizer. Design can be a great equalizer. And I think, you know, if we use our forces for good, it will be that. Of course, it should be elegant and beautiful. I mean, beautiful stuff is super nice. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, to remake ourselves. As designers, we are actually changing, already have changed. We talk, I mean, the headline of the presentation is talk something about post-craft, and we are living in a post-craft world. 
We are the change agents. We are the we're the ones actually to make the world, which means that we need to make ourselves. But remember, don't be jerks about it. Thank you. Uh, I will say one small thing about the tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we will have a workshop uh, where we actually gonna build a new tools together with you because I believe that uh, somebody or maybe everybody in this room has a methodology that would save the world. So please join tomorrow and, and let's work together. Maybe we have new slides next year. Uh, it will be very weird, you. very strange tomorrow, but let's see what happens. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Okay. Can I explain this? Because this is actually quite cool. I understand it sounds really abstract. All right. This was, by the way, this was done both by the end users and then the customer and, you know, our agency. So everyone could participate in the binaries, which is actually a really cool thing as well. All right. And now we have a service which is cheerful, which is detached, which is humoristic and these kind of things. But now, if you do this from the machine's viewpoint, you can say, okay, do, does it want to be tough or gentle? If the machine Motivation, this is the imaginary, of course, but if the machine's motivation is to be tough, then it reminds you about stuff, right? It nags you, right? Uh, neurotic or stable, <laughs> you know. Uh, actually, we made a use case of the chatbot that, let's say, 6 o'clock in the morning, I wake up and I ask something of it, and it says, okay, sorry, I just woke up, give me two seconds. It's your birthday, and it says, okay, well, hello, happy birthday, or... CEO of our company told me to send you greetings. I'm really nervous about this because I might be fired if you don't get this. These are not real like life actual like you know things, but this is what I, what we mean about you know creating subjectivity, making things emote. Uh, how many of you guys have you seen the movie Interstellar? Uh, remember the robot in it? I mean, there was this robot assistant like this metallic, shiny silver thing. The cool thing about one small fragment scene of the movie is that, I mean, it has, actually has a humor setting that you can put from one, it doesn't tell you jokes, to five, it's a silly asshole, you know? And this is what we mean by creating empathic machines. These micro-interactions will be the things that will determine which, pe which services people will want to use in the future. And once again, it's not about craft anymore. Creating these micro-interactions takes a lot of other skills than currently, let's say, design schools. You need to know about dramaturgy. You need to talk about, know about writing. You need to talk about, you know, all these kind of things. But yeah, I hope that opened up a little bit. Of course, you need to be a voracious reader, you know, understand stuff. But the cool thing is that, I mean, I think you should understand and, you know, experience stuff outside of the design discipline. For instance, I play games. I still play World of Warcraft. I'm a total nerd. I mean, I know. Please don't give me any shit about it. But um, what I've learned from World of Warcraft is flash leadership. Uh, social dynamics. A lot of these things in there are actually applicable to service design as inspiration. I could do, my, my second hobby is cooking. I'm really into food, restaurants, and cooking. And uh, there's a lot of stuff there that actually is really inspiring. It's not about you, it's just being a sponge. It doesn't even need to be so conscious because, I mean, we are all sponges. Designers are sensitive people. We get, like, you know, bombarded with messages, and unfortunately, sometimes we actually, the messages sink in and these kind of things. Just be open. It's yeah. not rocket science. It's not difficult, seriously. It's yeah. just about stepping out of some outside of your craft. In our our company, we have a people with very different backgrounds. So we have mathematicians, we have uh, visual designers, we have writers, we have uh, research people, we have me who does everything, and we have uh, engineers who do coding and and and. and 
sort of like talking with different, uh, talking about the topics and, and projects from the different pe point of view with the different people mm -hmm. and, and sort of like testing out different things, that actually open up, opens up a new ideas can, and, and new insights all the time. And oh, yeah. another important part is that uh, in NordCup we do a huge scale of different kind of projects. We sm work with the really small tech startups who has a amazing tech stuff coming up. And then we have a ING, a huge bank, which is uh, basically the biggest organization ever. And, and, and you can actually learn great stuff from all of those and, and combine. And then if you have a different industries, let's say banking and uh, augmented reality startup, they actually have a lot of things that they could do to each other's, even though they don't work at anyway in the same business, but they, you can learn and, and take disciplines from that to that and, and vice versa. But finally, um, of course, being a designer is not a nine to five job. It is basically a lifestyle. I mean, if you're a good designer, it means that you know, you, you're never working or you're always working. And this means that you need to know your shit as well. Because I mean, the world is full of people who wear black and wave their hands and talk about, you know, disruptive futures and don't know what they're saying. And these people are giving us a bad name. I mean, seriously, it is a serious thing. You've got to know your stuff. You need to be able to argument. You need to understand what you're saying and doing. Because, I mean, there's too many people who don't do that. And I think, you know, as, design, as a designer myself, that's one of my pet peeves. I take this stuff really seriously. Seriously. I mean, I'm super into it. I take it seriously. It's not a joke. Which means that we need to be really careful that we are able to be trusted. All right. Can I go have a cigarette now? Any other questions? Google's like, you know, mission statement used to be don't do evil, but who believes in that anymore? But the cool, good news, well, there's two things, I think. One is that of, yeah, well, the thing is, I mean, I, if I understood correctly, I mean, what's the role of, like, you know, there has been scandals like the Facebook election rigging, these kind of things, the ads with the Russians and stuff like that. So basically design can be a first for forceful bad things as well. I mean, and then it is coming to play. But there's two things. One is that, of course, we need to be ethical and mindful of these things, but accidents and mistakes will happen. I mean, it doesn't make Facebook intrinsically evil that they screw this thing up, you know. There's a lot of good things about it as well. But the biggest thing, I think, the biggest trend I see, my wife actually is the head of privacy and data protection for Sonoma, the biggest media company in Finland. I mean, she's super into, like, you know, consumer protection when it comes to data usage and such. But, I mean, uh, we, we'll go, go back to the second reason. There's two teleoperators. One, it's a pure money-making machine, but it's very cheap. The second one promises to treat me fairly, and it's a bit more expensive. I would choose the one which is a bit more expensive, but treats me fairly. So all these like, good, like, uh, responsible things are becoming super important for branding and for people to make like, positive decisions on. So in a way, that's a trend which is growing all the time. And I'm not distrustful of companies. I'm okay with companies making money, but you can make money two ways. One, just make money or make something interesting and useful and make money with it. And I think a lot of the companies currently are like curvetting towards the second option. I'm an optimist. Anything else? Well, we are really sort of, you know, fast on our feet. You know what I mean? We all know basically all the classical design tools. I mean, utilize them, use them in really good effects at some points. But we need to understand the context of the project or the challenge we are facing. And we need to be able to adapt accordingly. Which means that, you know, a lot of design agencies, let's say, uh, sell process first to the customer. 
we have this amazing service creation process. You buy into this stuff, and then you like you know assimilate it, and then we can start working together. We don't work like that. We come from the challenge first, and then we adapt the tools according to the challenge, which makes it much harder. We make less money than companies that can you know do this other way of things. But I think you know as a challenge is more interesting, and as my basic workday, it makes the workday more interesting. Not just about duplicating something, and especially it's not about forcing the customer or the client to, you know, follow our dance or ritual, because each ritual is unique. Rather, we try to understand the customer's own ritual and inject ourselves into it. Maybe just one last question, if anybody else has one. Nothing. All right. How, how did we do? Thank you, I love compliments. Anyways, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you, Matty and Patrick. That was really super interesting.